Good morning. I'm Yolanda King and I'm on the committee uh, that helped put this together. So I'm happy to be the moderator for the session for uh, careers, which is something near and dear to my heart. Um, and if my sound is breaking up, I will go off a of video. Is it still, Michelle? A little bit. A little bit. Okay, I'm going to go off a of video for just a bit. That usually helps. Um, I, it's my great pleasure to introduce our, our two participants, and that's Maggie Werner Washburn, Dr. Maggie, um, who I've known for quite a while, but she is a, a Regents Professor Emerita in Biology at UNM, a AAAS Lifetime Mentor and Fellow, uh, and you have her entire bio. I don't want to read the whole thing because I would take her time up, in, and she's got such brilliant ideas. After she finished uh, Working at UNM, she went on to uh, establish uh, New Mexico Boomerang, which I think is fabulous to bring students back to New Mexico. And she was a winner of the uh, 2021 Impact Award for her overall impact on young women in STEM. So Maggie, if there's anything else you want to add, I'm happy to have you do that. Uh, then Lorraine Modishaw founds who I've known for quite a while, um, has her degree in biomedical engineering and uh, from UNM, and she's been dedicated to working in some of the STEM workshops uh, at UNM and through the Graduate Student Association there at UNM. And she's on the New Mexico Network for Women in Science and Engineering Board. So she will be presenting after Maggie. Thanks, guys. Maggie, over to you. Maggie, you are muted. I was trying to be so clever. <laughs> Just a second. Now I got to share screen again. Good. Okay. Now I've now I lost that share screen. So hang on. They're doing me a favor, letting me share my screen. So thank you guys. Um, so I've worked for the past 35 years as a researcher and educator and a mentor at UNM and in Washington, DC, uh, in national organizations for science for uh, Chicanos and Native Americans and also AAAS and as a contractor at Sandia Labs in various areas, including computer sciences. So I've had just a really a fun career in my uh, time. In the last 15 years, I developed a, a pre-PhD program that turned out to be extremely successful. And so I'm, some of the things I'm talking about are things that I've learned through this program uh, that helped about 600 students from UNM and around the country uh, to develop career paths in academia, business, law, medicine, and uh, lots of other areas. And as Yolanda said, I founded uh, STEM Boomerang, which we is a company that we, we have to help connect STEM professionals, including my former students who either want to stay here or come back to find great careers in New Mexico. So there's three parts to what I'm going to talk about today. The first one is exploring data about women in, in, in uh, STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, the second part is talking about rediscovering imagination and how important imagination is for really being successful and having emotional intelligence and all of the stuff that you need to survive in STEM. And the last part, I want to discuss how I would approach coming up with ideas for local or regional activities. I've, I've loved what I've heard so far from this meeting, and I think this should fit right in with what you're, what you're wanting to think about. And then I wanna say, first of all, that there are three things that you should keep in mind when thinking about STEM careers. So first of all, we don't yet know what occupations are going to exist in five to 10 years. Quantum computing, fusion, precision medicine, artificial intelligence, and there are many more areas of research that are just developing. We have jobs right now that I couldn't have told you would exist five years ago. So second, there are many steps and challenges between K-12 education and a STEM career, especially for women, and what they're going to experience can, in moments, be daunting, and especially if they're not sure this is what they want to do. So having the right mentors, a supporting environment, and an opportunity to explore is really critical. Third, uh, we often forget that math, how important math is. It is really the key to the future of STEM. And math requires great imagination. It is one of the most imaginative areas of STEM, I think. And lots of young people, especially young girls, get a fear of math somehow. 
But if you can support them becoming more imaginative and realize that with good preparation, that rocket science isn't even rocket science, man, they can come to see that math is really beautiful. And it is a, and a, I can't even tell you how important that tool is for so many things, whatever they end up doing. So finally, girls like the rest of us, they need to know their hearts. They need to know what's valuable to them. What is interesting? Curiosity and discovery create a momentum that clears a path for young girls and for women um, to do all sorts of things, very creative things, some of which in STEM and, and, and in any area. So, so I want first to look at the data and talk about what it tells us and what it doesn't tell us. Okay, so this is a graph that shows the percentage of women as a function of all people in higher education. And what you see is that, I don't know if you could see my pointer, but by the late seventies, women have been represented 50% of students in college. And now it's about 57, 58%, okay? We can see your pointer. You can? Yes. Yes. Okay. But these yes. are averages. These are averages. So they don't represent all majors or even all schools. Okay. So this isn't reflected at MIT and this isn't reflected in many STEM classes, especially not reflected in the demographics of faculty in STEM departments. And although the representation of, of women in academia is growing, um, it's slow. Okay, so we have a lot of work to do. The second graph shows you the difference in earning power or the premium for a college education between a high school education and a college education. So it's $35,000 and that sounds fantastic, doesn't it? But this difference, this premium is really dependent on your major and what you choose to do with it. You, and you can graduate with a biology major, for example, and be ready to get a job that pays well or not be able to do anything. It, so getting a degree can be a very valuable thing. But what you earn depends on what you learn and what you do with it. And what you learn is a, a function of what you find fascinating, what the students feel um, empowered to uh, have, be curious about. And all of that is influenced by a student's imagination and by the ulti ultimately by the experience they get. So let's look a little bit further into the career ladder. Now this is women in STEM occupations, okay? So you can see that it varies from a high of about 46% in biology, biological sciences, to about 16% with engineers and architects. So again, these are broad categories and the specific jobs within these categories can vary massively in terms of responsibility, work and salary. This graph is from 2020. Since then, the workforce has changed significantly, especially with the increase in remote work. A lot of programmers have just read about it today, you know, Google, Microsoft, everybody's laying off all their, a lot of people, talented people. And there's significant opportunity for them here in New Mexico. But, you know, how do we make these connections? That's always an issue. But the theme of the work for the past two years, <laughs> so we're now working like in five-year shifts as we think of work at STEM, but the theme of work for the past two years has really been movement and change. And to manage this change in jobs and the work environment, the young professionals I know are always thinking about where the next step will be and especially about starting their own businesses. And to do that, they need mentors. And I imagine there's a lot of people in Rotary, um, my dad used to be in Rotary, um, that can help them to meet local or state level investors to understand what venture capital is like, to understand intellectual property, to understand how you start a business, to understand that it's okay if your first business fails, you know, if, to understand what kinds of things you went through. You know, these are all very useful because they love to see people who have survived. Okay, it's always a comfort to know that, you know, people have gotten through what you're having to look at now. 
um, and also helping them think about business models because in academia and STEM, we never learn about these kinds of things. It's only been since I've been with STEM Boomerang that I've picked these things up. So let's take one more look at the data. And this is a higher level um, look at women in the workforce. Okay, so what you see here, this is a graph, and what you see is that th this women of color and white women, and again, averages, but you know, you're looking around and you find these numbers. Um, and entry level, there, you know, there's about 48% um, here. And then as you get down, it's about 26% up to the C suite. All right. So again, you got to understand this varies between company. It varies uh, in the type of jobs. In STEM fields and startups, for example, the decrease between here and here, uh, and we don't have C-suites, but we have presidents and provosts and, and vice presidents and all these administrators and, and faculty, the, the drop is even steeper, okay? So I have no doubt that these demographics, these diagrams and, and figures are going to change for the young woman, well, young women that you're thinking of working with. Um, and it, it's also been shown that women run companies, so I read a lot of Harvard Business Review, um, women run companies have been very successful. And that diversity is a huge strength on boards. Um, but in some areas, the change is really stalled. And girls need to be resilient and have good allies and be good allies. So it's really about having, you know, having your network be a team for you as you're going through these things. You always have somebody to call. Um, Non-random distributions aren't depressing for me so much. Uh, it was when I was like moving up the ladder and really wanted to be president and never could get there, but um, they show areas of opportunity. Uh, I always felt like uh, when I was at school and and hitting my head against uh, so many incredible walls, it was amazing to me. Uh, there was always a door, and sometimes I was too stubborn to see it. But I always had, you know, friends and allies and mentors that would help me figure out the best way forward, and it's been almost magical. So, in working with young women, let me just say that it's really important to be honest and be prepared to work with them to create the tools and identify the tools that they're gonna to need to succeed. <clears throat> this is a picture of one of the cohorts of the four to 600 students that I mentored. This is the 400 in the pre-PhD program, 200 out of that program. Um, in any event, uh, in this picture, three of them were in grad school. The rest were all undergraduates. And now at, in that picture are 13 PhDs, three masters, three MDs, three bachelor's degrees, and they're all doing really fun, incredible things. So it's just so, you know, working with young people is, is fantastic. So I would encourage you to do whatever you think is gonna work the best. Um, but in this program, I realized, so these are kids from UNM, right? There, um, many of them were um, Pell Grant. Uh, uh, these kids probably grew up with, uh, you know, uh, free lunches and stuff. I, they had hard lives, some of them. Uh, you know, I had some students that had uh, felonies in their past. Uh, it didn't matter to me. In fact, I like the students that had, had those kinds of challenges. Um, but many of our students were in particular majors because a relative had suggested it or some advisor had set them on a path. Um, those who knew what they wanted to do uh, frequently set their sights too low. They had a very uh, uh, undeveloped uh, idea of their capabilities. Uh, you know, just I don't, anyway. So that was what was fun for me too. Um, finally, they also might have a deficit view of themselves, feel that everybody else knew more and that their abilities were fixed or couldn't be improved. It's it's sort of a more of the imposter syndrome, but. Um, uh, it was actually that they didn't have a, a growth mindset about themselves. Um, and about 20 years ago, I discovered that the students, it, it shocked me and made me really sad. And I got, I spent a year studying this kind of thing, um, that the students were not using their imaginations to learn science. 
and I can't, I know it's, or you cannot, you can't believe it. I could put him in a catatonic state in about 10 minutes. Um, I came to see how important it was for them to understand that the magic was inside them, that all the answers were not going to be found in a Google search. We spent a lot of time learning how to exercise our imagination muscle. It was really hard. Many of the students in my classes would get mad at me. And then when they realized how to do it, they just uh, became so happy. But I realized that these students had been rewarded at home in school for passive learning, uh, from memorization to TV and movies, and really not rewarded for exercising their creative muscle. So that was a game changer for me. Um, I had a, a set of four principles. I, I'd have to talk to you some other time about that. It's, I'm sure you have similar kinds of things, but it was extremely useful in the structure of this program and the success of this program. But I'm going to talk about imagination. So once I realized that the students, um, the issue was not what we were doing at UNM or in my class or whatever, but that it was a national issue and, and, and the underlying problems in education were that, uh, the, that we had not um, allowed creativity to be part of, of how we learn so that school wasn't fun for kids, okay? That I began to include visualizations in class. Um, we'd become a piece of DNA or we'd go into a cell. Um, and I also developed classes in discovery and innovation, which would bring in people from all different walks of life to talk about their experiences. And um, we would get on the creative ride of these people. It was a three hour class. And I worked to help them learn how to reframe their experiences really quickly so that something bad happens. You have like four different ways to take a look at it so that you know that you can choose how to respond, that nobody can make you do stuff. And um, this helped them tremendously with emotional intelligence, resilience, and also with optimism. And they could learn from failures instead of being victims of them. Okay, <clears throat> so to teach imagination, you know, I had to work on my own imagination. And I begin to think about how we look at education. And we talk about education as a pipeline. And as I realized the students were in this sort of resonance of passive education, I thought, oh my gosh, the pipeline really is a perfect uh, image of that. Uh, <laughs> but what are, what are the implications for how we think of students, right? They're just as fluid going through this pipeline. If they're in the middle of this beautiful forest, they can't see it. How do they get into the pipeline? I mean, can they get in at different, different parts? We would talk about the leaky pipeline, people taking time off, people going other directions as a failure of our educational system. And man, I think that is totally, <laughs> totally wrong. Um, so, you know, education should stimulate curiosity. There's no reason that learning shouldn't be fun. We should want to learn. Um, and, and, we're, and we give that up when we're too passive. We give up all that to whatever is going to come our way rather than what kind of things do we have inside of us. So we think we're watching, we think that watching an animated movie makes us more creative like Harry Potter. Oh, you know. But it, it shows us what other people can do we create this resonance of passive education that is reinforced with phones and streaming services. I suffer from this, okay? That help us forget what it feels like to be creative ourselves. Students think that Google searches have all the answers they don't. And we may not realize that imagination is a muscle. It is a human superpower that can be developed. The problem is, um, you know, when you ask a particular questions, you ask students to do a particular thing it, using their imagination, they are not familiar with how to access it. They don't know if they're any good at it and they do not know what the rewards are. So why would you even try it? I mean, it has to be tr someone you trust to get you to do those exercises. But at some point students stop asking questions and that's the key is like, if the students are asking questions and great questions, then they're using their imaginations. 
but the students stop thinking beyond what they're asked to learn and beyond what they see. Just they're hooked up on models. This models, don't, they're always assumptions in models and they don't go past those. So this really spells trouble. You guys are all reading about chat GPT and artificial intelligence and all that. If we don't reclaim our imaginations, we're in serious trouble. <laughs> okay. So to teach imagination, we have to work on our own imaginations. That where is that guy? Okay, we've missed a, oh yeah, okay, you're here. So I imagine education as a walk with my students to the tops of their mountains or as close as we can get. So when I meet a student, I often think about, you know, how far I think they can get. And, and it's kind of a game, you know, they can go below or above, but it's just kind of, I, I just sort of see where we can go. And I imagine uh, walking with my students to the tops of their mountains or as far as we can get and where, and then they get to the top and they can choose where they want to go. If they want to go down a pipeline, go for it. If you want to go down an arroyo, a path, whatever, you know, and right now, all these kids, <laughs> they're in universities and their companies analyzing genomics, they're doing precision medicine, they're patent law, they're dentist engineers. I mean, I can't even tell you the blessing of having worked with so many young people at, at UNM and, and I miss it terribly. Uh, so I'm helping with other things, but these guys, my student, former students work in government businesses, um, from Lockheed to Lanel, they're in startups. They've had, they've started businesses themselves. And because they trust their imaginations, they're doing well. One of the things that having a, a real firm uh, understanding of your own imagination, what it does is it really reduces anxiety, right? Because you're not afraid of what's going to happen next. You know that you can think your way around it. You know you have the tools to deal with whatever comes your way uh, rather than having everything be like, you know, I got to get my phone and, and do a search. Um, the students begin to trust themselves to take new paths and to find new solutions. So here's one of the things. So I just want to share how I found this out because it's, you won't believe it probably. Um, I. I started by asking the students to close their eyes. These are seniors at, at UNM and grad students. And I asked them to close their eyes and imagine going, and they've had every biology class, how to go into a cell. And, what, and we got them through the cell wall because I work on yeast. We get them through the plasma lemma. We get a certain size, we have to be really small. And then I asked them what they saw. And there was complete silence. And I waited and I waited and I waited. And I asked a young woman what she saw and she said balls. So I realized that they had not, they didn't have any imagination of what they were learning. So then I had this old table from a, from a genetics paper. And um, I don't know what your uh, reaction would be. These kids have had a lot of biology. So they sort of expected themselves to immediately have a conclusion from this table. Um, uh, so, but I was trying to get them to, I was trying to understand how it was that they interacted with data, you know, how they moved into it. Um, and there was one young person who I it was, he would say, oh, it's something this or that, some oddball thing. And I'd say, well, tell me what it is you see. And he would just go, and then he, then the kids started shaking and crying. And he said, tell me what it is you want me to see. And I said, um, well, uh, there's five columns, one's, uh, you know, one's numerical order, so it's probably samples, and these are probably related, but this column is shorter than this column, and there's a lot of ones here. And I will tell you, out of 20 kids in my genomics, senior genomics class, they couldn't do this. Um, and so we spent the whole year kind of learning how to, how to do this. And Five or six years later, I called this young man and I said, tell me what you got from my class. And he said, well, genomics is the future of medicine. So it was great. He said, you're going to think it's very silly, but you know how we used to imagine going inside a cell. I do that all the time. It's how I learned immunology and all the stuff in medicine. I'm the best at it. And young women had the same experience and they're, they're just doing great. But, I, you know, it's shocking. But most of the time we don't ask students to do these kinds of things. 
And there's the, the key to understanding what was happening was these research by two great women in Colorado who study children from zero to five. And I, I, I'm convinced they don't quite understand the implications of their work, but they said if these children zero to five are not allowed to pretend to play, they lose symbolic and analytical reasoning and empathy. And you can look in, you can look in the schools and it starts at middle school when the kids really probably need play and imagination brought back into the thing. In high school, it's the same thing. I have a sense that there's a lot of, of sort of where students give up who they are to uh, external conditions rather than realizing that this beautiful stuff is inside themselves. So the next part I'm gonna talk about is how Rotarians might help with this, you know, cause that's, I guess that's, I was glad to hear that's kind of what you wanted to think about. So the way I would approach this is I would think, you know, what is the level of engagement that I'm interested in or our group is interested in? I mean, do we wanna look globally or do we wanna look, you know, at my local school? Do we wanna work at the state level, my economic region, whichever it is. And then you say, well, what are our goals? Do we want, is our goal that students know how to present themselves? Is it successful completion of a project? Is it being able to make a plan? Is it graduation on and on and on so that you can think about that? So what are the potential outcomes of this activity that we've chosen? And those can change at any time. And I'm probably not telling you anything. You probably have all done this in your businesses, but you can learn from the team, right? So what do you, but you have to really pay attention and you have to be like, I think it's the most important thing to really have your face in whatever level of, of work you're doing to really be able to be authentic and honest and insightful about how to create change, how to inspire people, right? And, and then you have to learn from the young women, you know, what motivates them? What do they love? And I also talked earlier about a bug list. Bug lists are great because those really, sometimes those are business opportunities. <laughs> you know, a, a bug list is a, great, is a wonderful thing. Um, then you have to say, well, what is it that we bring to the table? You know, what is it? So I'm a this or I'm a that. I've had uh, experience in government. I've had experience uh, with the military. I've had experience in business, um, in banking, in whatever. What is it that you bring to the table? Because those are your skills and resources. And then refine your ideas and include the students and, and teachers. Your first attempt may not be the most successful, but you go back and, and dig in and go, how do I do this? How do I do this? Because that's the way my program improved. And I will tell you by the end, um, I, you know, I, I would love to replicate it. I'm, I'm working with uh, people in Guam actually to try to do some of this. So. So then after you've done this first ex exercise, then you kind of think, well, what is it that we can do? So as I was thinking about this, I'm not in Rotary at this point, but um, I, we do with STEM Boomerang, we do career fairs. And uh, we jumped right into online career fairs, um, you know, when the pandemic hit. But you all have amazing networks of people, right? And, of, uh, you know, I would love to bring in some ranchers about a career fair. I'd love to bring in a, you know, I, I grew up in a rural area and I, I love horses and I'm always thinking about how to bring this into what we do. But, <clears throat> you know, I could see Rotarians putting together some just incredible career fairs or short um, talks to kids about different careers. Uh, I think part of the issue with the UNM students is that they had no idea what was out there. I didn't have an idea what was out there when I started college. And um, so I, I think you could do something really exciting. I'd be happy to help you with this. Uh, I, it, but um, a way to get the students uh, not to go, well, that's exactly what I want, but I like to solve those kinds of problems. Um, I like those kinds of challenges. Uh, this fits with the kinds of things I'm enjoying learning in school. Okay. The other thing that I have been thinking about um, for, a, for, I set up another program for uh, uh, freshmen, sophomores and transfer students that really targeted Native American students because I didn't see them thinking about research uh, for the pre-PhD program. And we, 
put together a survival manual where all the students contributed to it. And, uh, and you could have it be a survive and thrive manual, something like that. But I thought maybe I, I can do this as a more positive way to, <laughs> to talk about it. Um, and it's something I just suggested to uh, a, a program at the University of Utah in biochemistry because they're having, you know, kids are depressed right now. This pandemic really hurt them. And, and they need to really relearn how to have one-on-one -on -one conversations. Uh, my students in a year, couple, two or three years ago had never seen a conversation where two people who disagreed came to a common, to a, a consensual solution, right? To came together. They had never seen that. So they avoided any conversation that was going to look like it could end up in disagreement. So I taught four classes on conversations. Um, anyway, so you, when you're doing this thing, you can do it online, say a Google Docs or something where people can contribute. Somebody should moderate just so people don't write awful things. But you know, who do I ask for help to survive this thing? Who's the, who's the most helpful person in high school? Who's the most inspiring person that I like for this? You know, positive, that sort of thing. Um, but my worst week was really useful. I had a bike accident. I, I, I wrecked my shoulder, but you know, I managed to do this. All these people helped me. So it was, it was ways for them to find empathetic examples of survival and bug lists, especially now. But I also had them write personally write down what it is that whenever they thought about that made them feel better. And my perfect job, and I will say in, when I'm helping um, PhDs and postdocs, especially uh, look for jobs, I say, what's your perfect job? And they don't know. Uh, they're thinking about, again, that somebody's gonna offer them this perfect job. But I think it's, again, bringing it back to, you know, you've got, you've got the magic inside you. Open-ended discovery projects. And again, this would come like, what's, what's the most inter interesting thing for you? And really dig down. You know, I loved science fairs when I was judging kids who, not just the tortilla on the table, but, you know, which lure works best for trout? Uh, what happens when I put these two kinds of ants together? You know, kids that were asking things with the tools that were at their level where they could really manipulate them. And finally, I think all of you guys have stories. You have wonderful stories about big challenges, about survival. And I think, uh, you know, as you develop a relationship with young people or with whoever you're going to work with, you know, just sharing these things because you have, you are so valuable. You have so much of a richness just within the group of people who's here. And questions, keep your eye open for questions, make the students ask questions, whatever. They take curiosity, confidence, and imagination. It's part of active learning. There's a whole thing about active learning. I don't think you can do it well until, um, until you have really intentionally uh, restored your imagination. Hi, so Maggie. anyway, that's, yeah. That's it. Okay. Perfect timing. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. You're always, you're always just thinking about new creative ways yourself, just about. <laughs> it's um, been fun. But we're going to, we're going to take questions at the end. So I want to get Lorraine on and uh, Lorraine is, like I said, on the board for the New Mexico Network for Women in Science and Engineering. Um, and so let's see, you'll have to quit sharing. I think there we go. And Lorraine's going to share the, the Women in Science and Engineering website, talk a little bit about herself, being a, a young engineer, and a little bit about how she got into it, and then also about some of the hands-on workshops. I noticed, I think we have Cherry Birch, who's part of our student outreach on as well. So uh, with Lorraine's permission, if Cherry wants to kibitz at the end, that might be good. Um, and then also about the tools that are available on this website. So Lorraine, over to you. All right, sounds great. And yeah, I wouldn't mind if Cherry spoke up because she knows a lot about the different conferences and stuff in New Mexico. So she'd have, on top of what I'm already going to say, extra things that Rotarians can do to come help out women in STEM. So hi, my name is Lorraine Madashaw Founds. Um, so just a little bit of background about me. I originally came from Idaho in a very rural area and then moved to New Mexico after I got my bachelor's degrees there. Um, and I just, uh, I really enjoyed Maggie's talk, and I think that a lot of the things that she said make sense. 
And I would agree with a lot of the things that she said, just going over some of my experiences in learning and wanting to become an engineer. Um, I had a mentor in sixth grade who was a female mechanical engineer that helped me discover my interest in engineering through like a Lego league tournament that I participated in and just the things that she talked about with me. And then in the middle school, high school time, I went through a girl state, which was provided by both Rotary and um, the American Legion, where I got to go to a place outside of the hometown that I had never left that I had grown up in to learn how to speak in front of people and learn more about our government. But it also taught me how to be confident and how to really explore my imagination in terms of I'm not just a person interested in math, but I can also be someone who does math in a government setting or someone that goes and speaks to the public about things that she's interested in when typically other people hadn't listened to me. And then before I went into college, I was really lucky in that my father went to uh, the local university, Idaho State University. So I got to talk to some of the professors and got to really explore and visualize myself in a STEM type field by just talking to the professors, attending colleges, seeing what they were talking about and learning more about what it was to be in a STEM field and what it was like to be a professor. And then during college, I got into a lot of the female societies where I got to see females who were in the field and to talk to females and to talk to other women who were engineers to imagine what my pathway was going to be, what fields I could go down. And in my undergraduate last year as a senior, I got to take an active learning class in tissue engineering, which really spurred on my interest in tissue engineering, where the professor would sit us down, have us read papers, and we had to come to class with questions. He wouldn't teach the paper to us. We had to come and bring our own questions, and he would answer them for us using the paper's material, which really got me interested in learning how to read papers, learning how to write papers, and learning about the materials in the papers. And then um, on top of that, after graduating, it's really been a lot of learning how to rely on other people and finding other female mentors to try and find jobs outside of the people that I know and my network that I have. So learning how to network, how to talk and how to find mentors and people to encourage you through that process. That's very difficult, especially like me, where I'm typically moving around a lot and I have to try and make new networks and new fields of people at the different places that I move to. So some of the things that Rotarians can do to help out women in STEM is uh, first off the so our New Mexico network that we have is literally a group of people. This is a group started around the 1970s that was specifically looking at like Los Alamos and what like the women working for Los Alamos and what they were doing and why they were there. But it grew to the entire New Mexico area. So now what the New Mexico network does is they typically recruit um, like professionals in the STEM area to help uh, girls around the middle, um, the middle school area in order to try and get them interested in STEM or to keep their interest in STEM by giving them direct mentors and then also fun activities that incite their imagination to try and get them to um, see themselves in a STEM position, as well as we uh, give funding and do networking events and connect people around New Mexico to try and encourage women and girls in the science and engineering fields. Um, so um, this talks about the 1975 vision with Los Alamos and about like some of the women on our website. Oh, if you want to check it out, the website is nmnwse.org. We can also share a link if that's something that any of the Rotarians would be interested in as well. So beyond just the um, network itself, one of the options that we give girls as a way to explore and really visualize themselves in different STEM fields is we have a careers in STEM page where the girls can access this page for free. You don't need there's no signing up, no login, nothing. They can just access this page and the girls can choose different interests and skills that they're interested in. So like curiosity or data or exploration, it can be something abstract or something very concrete. Like I want to be an engineer or I want to be a detective. And then they click on what they want. So in this case, we're going to do engineering 
and then you can click apply filters and it will show you different paths with that uh, career mentality in mind to show you what that would be like. So for the engineering field, for instance, you can pull up the engineering page. Hold on. There we go. And in that page, it'll tell you what they do, how they're, um, sorry, the screen sharing isn't getting out of the way. So, so it'll tell you what the job is, what you need to do for that job, what life is going to be like. So what your work life balance is, what are you doing on the day to day, what you need to do as the pathway to become, and then what kind of jobs you're going to get. And these are direct written by people in the field for people in the field. So it's people who have already gone through and have done it and they wrote it down to let the girls know how to do it. And then on the side, we also have resources for websites that are similar to those things. So any like groups or um, websites that we found, those sorts of things that can help them explore more if they want to learn more about archaeology, engineering, whatever. And then on the side, we also have an author who willingly stood up and said, hey, uh, I was the person, one of the people that helped to write this. And they give their contact information, including phone numbers and email addresses. So that way, if the girls have questions or if they have um, uh, questions, clarification, that sort of a thing, they can contact the author and have their questions answered. And it can be anything from how did you get into this field and why do you do it to very specific questions like what do you do and why do you do what you do? They are free and open for the girls to contact and to talk to. Um, and then the last thing that we do is we typically hold STEM conferences. So one of the big things that the New Mexico Network does is we get funding from across New Mexico in order to do STEM conferences all across New Mexico. So we currently have um, conferences in Carlsbad, Albuquerque, Las Cruces, Northern New Mexico, two in Santa Fe, and then one in Silver City. Um, and what these are is they're conferences where young girls uh, come in and we recruit female professionals working in areas around them doing STEM and they come and they do short like one hour long um, like presentations where the girls get to do something fun with their hands like one of the ones I worked with the one in Albuquerque for about three years and one of the presentations that the girls absolutely loved is one of the ladies from uh, uh, Sandia National Labs would come in as a chemist and she would teach them the chemistry of making different materials for makeup. So they'd make blush and they'd make lipstick and they make other things. And it was one of the most like sold out. We always had to prioritize that one because the girls loved that class and they came out of it always excited and wanting to be a chemist because they're like, I didn't know I could make cosmetics. This is amazing. Um, so doing uh, volunteering for events like this is a great way to get active and organized and you can get on boots on the ground talking to a lot of these girls. Um, another way you can help is always by giving money so that way the groups can expand and target more girls, um, especially because we can't get them to a lot of the very rural areas. So the more money, the larger we can expand and the more we can do things like bus girls in from rural areas to come to events like this. Um, but outside of the New Mexico network, we also have other events across New Mexico that we will support either in volunteer time or through money. So we have NMOST, which is the New Mexico out of school time network, which um, is basically where and Cherry can also answer any questions if you have some questions about these. And most is where if the kids are outside of uh, school and they need things to do, they uh, have days where the kids can come in and do like crafts and activities that are STEM based. So that way they're not just sitting at home bored. Um, and then the state science and engineering fair, which is where anyone comes in and they do a presentation of like this science and engineering projects that they have done. We always give out a scholarship 
for female participants specifically and um, to showcase what work that they have done. And we try to choose those who are not already going to get awards. So that way we can uplift them and make them feel like their voice is heard, even if they didn't get an, or win an award. Uh, the supercomputing challenge, which is a team of female participants from the fifth through the 12th grade, where they're supposed to do like coding and other STEM based stuff. Best Robotics, which is part of the, I believe it's the same robotics group that I was a part of, where they build robots and then um, we give an award out to that team. And then the AAUW Tech Trek, which is a summer camp, kind of like what we do with the girls. The difference is, is that they use, um, they do like, I, I believe it's more robotics based, but again, it's like a technology STEM coding based program during the summer where the girls go for about a week and then they go um, work on this event. So one of the ways that you can help obviously is by, again, providing funding or volunteer time to any of these organizations because they are specifically focusing on females and women in STEM. And then the last pitch I would give is that um, Maggie reminded me as she was giving her presentation, another group specifically in Albuquerque, if any of you are in Albuquerque or know anyone in Albuquerque, is Explora is also exploring the idea of STEM and imagination, specifically with trying to leave questions really open ended. So instead of quizzing students and specifically super young kids about you know, why is this bug red, right? Instead of waiting for them to have the answer that you want to give them to give back to you, they're all about just asking the question. And they say things like, why is this bug this way? What do you notice about the bug? And they just start asking those questions and trying to culture their imagination, specifically around the STEM experience, instead of just uh, wanting them to feed the answer that you want back to them. So if you have any questions on that, I would also highly encourage you to look at Explora and what they're doing out in Albuquerque. Great. Thank you. I didn't know if Cherry wanted to say a little bit about Tech Trick or, yeah, or not, sure. but sure. <laughs> I want to say something about everything. Lorraine did a great job <laughs> of describing the yes, program. Yes, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> they, they are wonderful. Um, I am, I'm retired. I used to work as a computer scientist uh, for first half of my career. And then I switched to teaching high school computer science. And I'm a volunteer, kind of a lifetime volunteer. I've been Girl Scout leader in my past. I've been a Boy Scout leader in my past, Cub Scout leader in my past. I worked for Lego League, um, judge science fairs, supercomputing challenge, mentor. Um, but uh, I'm now, want to know most about what New Mexico Network is doing. And we do have a lot of, uh, lot. we have several um, programs like Lorraine described, one day programs where we have women come and talk about their, uh, well, do a workshop activity with the kids. We like them to be hands-on activities because we're trying to excite the girls about. I, I'm, I'm going to intercede and say we preferentially try and get women, but it doesn't have to be women. <laughs> and we usually, those are usually for middle school girls. Um, I'm currently also involved with Girls Who Code, and I'm a facilitator at my local elementary school. I see those girls twice a month, and we, we work on coding and building a sisterhood. That's a part of Girls Who Code's um, mission. But I'm also a member of the American Association of University Women, AAUW, and we have the residential camp that Lorraine talked about. Um, it's for girls who are currently in the seventh grade. The camp is for one week in the summer, and we do hands-on workshops, field trips, and class classes, and activities, all STEM related. All, almost all, <laughs> as uh, Yolanda pointed out, almost all female teachers for all of our classes. Um, we are currently accepting nominations for girls for this summer and the nominations close on January 27th. So if you know somebody you think might be interested, it would be great if they would contact me. They have to be nominated by their seventh grade math or science teacher. Um, and that's a but, great way to reach out across the entire district really because we need people to support state. those young people. Yeah. yeah, it's for the whole state. So everybody, anybody living in New Mexico can uh, be nominated. Once they're nominated, they receive an application and they'll be filling that out next month. But 
the nominations have to come in now. Um, so let's see, we need some questions. Let's see, uh, Neil, do this, does the school know about these opportunities? Oh, that's a good question because it's that's a tough nut to break. Uh, we send it out. Uh, I, I've, I personally have gone and met with science teachers. We usually go to their annual conference for the math and science teachers. That's been off for a few years now, but we're, we're getting back into that. But um, that's where I think Rotarians could help is getting the word out on some of these opportunities. Oops, 10 minutes. So um, I'll shut up and let somebody else speak. <laughs> well, Donna, Donna would be next. Um, yes, I, <laughs> I'm going to sort of go back to Maggie. Uh, for the last 15 years, I have mentored foreign graduate students at UNM in business and management, um, which has been a phenomenal experience. But about four weeks, three weeks ago, I was asked to go into a career day in a high school. I haven't been in a high school in a very long time. And I have to admit, I went home sort of horrified. Um, my first class had about 40 students, half of which came in and sat at long tables with their back to the teacher. Um, I, I just couldn't imagine. I made everybody move. I'm sure they were ready to throw me out. But at any rate, I made them turn around and we, we did engage. My next group had 80 people in an auditorium and I got into career issues asking, you know, what did they want to do? These were juniors and seniors in high school. And again, sort of horrified, a number of girls stood up and said, oh, I wanna, I wanna be a marine biologist. And I said, well, what are you doing to reach that goal? They had absolutely no idea what would be required to reach that goal. And I found it across all of the careers that students did ask about. And I'm just, as I said, I've, I've tried to help at the, the graduate level in college. But as I looked at these students and talked to them over the course of six hours that day, I just thought how many of them are going to fall through the crack and never make it to the point that you all are talking about. Several wanted to be engineers. They had no idea what that meant. I mean, just none. I, right. I, I was incredulous. And so I don't know. I, I applaud everything that you're doing. Um, but I do think that maybe we need to, to back up and look to try to feed more students into college in the appropriate fields of their interest. Uh, three of the students followed me out to my car in the parking lot afterwards and said that it was the first time anyone had ever asked them what they thought they wanted to do after school. And so I just, it's just a suggestion that perhaps we need to back some of this up and, and look at how we might be able to help a little further down the chain. Um, that's all. I just, well, I, I came home so depressed. I was, yeah. I can't so, tell you. <laughs> Donna, I'm going to, I'm going to insert that like the Carlsbad effort that we were citing is sixth grade. And most of the hands-on workshops are mid-school. They, mm -hmm. they, we allow mm -hmm. high school in, but we try and get to young girls as early as possible. Sure. So I, that's sad that you, you experience that, but it's, it's not uniform across the state or across the district. I mean, there are some areas where there's a lot of activity and opportunity and there's other areas where it's not. We just, the New Mexico Network for Women in Science and Engineering along with several other organizations went down to Las Cruces uh, in October and restarted mm -hmm. the one there because it had faltered. Um, and that's a big population area. Sure. Oh, I, I absolutely applaud so it's hard. what you've been talking about. I'm um, just in terms of Rotary and Rotarians, as we're thinking about this, about perhaps what clubs might be able to do. That was all I was suggesting is that. Um, right. No, no, I'm agreeing with you that earlier, earlier is better. I mean, we Maggie, I think, has been unmuted here for a minute. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. 
Yeah, yeah, I, this is absolutely right. Middle school is a place to start. Um, you know, uh, there was a group of kids that my kids went to Wilson and Highland, which are, you know, have bad reputations. There were five kids that uh, that really gave the math teacher a hard a hard bunch of trouble. And they got, thank God, somebody got them an itinerant math teacher to come and teach them um, for seventh and eighth grades. Anyway, the, one young woman is now a PhD engineer from Cambridge and helping London with their uh, 2030 uh, climate goals. But <clears throat> middle school is really important. That's where the kid, they change a lot in middle school. Um, but, but I think the thing is that, you know, when I was first starting, look, what's the problem with education? It's the, you know, the teachers are bad, the kids are lazy, the parents aren't doing their jobs. And I thought if that was the only problem, we would have fixed it. You know, so I really spent a year going around trying to figure out what was the problem. And I, I love it because it's, it's like a big, hard problem and people want to like just hammer on the top of it. But I do think that once you work on imagination a bit and Legos are awesome, Legos are awesome. Um, that the kids start, begin to understand what they're worth and they get, you know, this self-efficacy, they call it, or empowerment, self-empowerment. Um, and then they can start to think about that. So my kid had a sixth grade career fair. We were in DC that year. The previous career fairs here in Albuquerque had been all the usual subjects. Um, the career fair in DC was astronauts, ambassadors, I mean, a million people. And I think that Rotary, you guys have the potential to create those kind of career fairs where, where kids could, could, could see this, but, but they don't know the path to that. So then you go back and say, well, if you want to talk, you know, name the three people you want to talk to more and then set up a webinar and then have them really talk about what it takes to get there because they don't know engineering. They don't know what CS is. I see Richard's hand up. Um, Maggie, I was uh, on a record team, so I was, uh, I was impressed with the um, your um, your um, talk about imagination and education. I was at an architects conference years ago in Washington D.C. and I cannot remember the British educator that addressed these architects, but he was talking about the lack of imagination. Um, in education, and they did a study starting with, I think, five-year-olds, and followed that those five-year-olds through um, through graduation, through uh, eighteen year, years old. Um, you know, with um, um, following imagination and in, in, um, in education, and he said, "Of course, I'm preaching to the choir here. You know, a bunch of architects, and you know, we we were the guys that always are and girls that always." colored outside the lines or finished coloring inside the lines and then drew something adjacent to the <laughs> the chicken or whatever we were supposed to be coloring. So um, so I, I'm glad to hear that. But his his whole point was that imagination was key uh, uh, and would be key to solving um, issues in our society. That the, the issues have become so much more complex and there's not one necessarily one right answer to a an issue now and so um, I just thought that was that was interesting I'm glad to hear that that uh, edu uh, that imagination is getting into education well I don't know if it is but I will say some of the students I worked with I had a young woman from Alamogordo um, who was from you know a normal family one one of them lived over in the with a trailer if you know Alamogordo but there's a side of the town where it's all trailers but anyway she's now working and I can't remember the name of the of the group and it's um, like Frontiers Organization or something. Anyway, there it's a think tank. And so she just finished her PhD and now she's at this think tank and Moderna who developed the COVID vaccine came out of that think tank. She's just having a riot. And uh, so these kids have, we have brilliant kids all over the place and, and they just need someone who can help them make that leap so that they can do this. But architecture is a great way to think about stuff. I think Neil has a related question. Oh, uh, I don't know if it's a so much a question as uh, you know a statement. In in our environment, Carlsbad, we're a relatively small town, and we're we are fairly isolated. And in my experience, um, I find not just girls, but girls in particular, don't know what opportunities are out there as far as jobs are concerned. Um, I was very fortunate. I. I push very hard, push all my kids kind of, I don't want to say kind of hard. Um, so in, in my daughter's case, she's now uh, 
studying environmental engineering. She's starting her master's program now at Texas Tech. Um, but when she started, uh, she just had a propensity for math. Uh, in fact, uh, she was acing all her math classes. And uh, I think a professor just offhand suggested that she take an engineering course in, in um, electric, electronic engineering. Uh, and she, she was the only girl in that particular class. Uh, and she ended up acing the class uh, and ended up helping the boys get through their, their studies as well. Uh, and then uh, he actually, her professor recommended her for a REMS program. Um, you, some of you might be familiar with that. It's an internship opportunity in the summer for, for certain people. She was accepted into that program. It had a huge impact uh, on her career. Uh, in her thought process. She was going to go for environmental science, um, and a professor stopped her and asked her why, uh, and then explained the difference between environmental engineering and environmental science to her. Um, that made a huge difference. So, so I'm going to intercede. We're going to oh, get yeah, booted yeah. out of here in just a few seconds. Sorry. I just want to make sure we thank everybody. I put it in chat, yeah. but thanks, guys. It was good. Good discussion, and I think we've got lots of room for follow-up and, and